full thing out on YouTube because we live stream things to uh, Igniter TV, aka Sean Zeminski, and Mike Ludermoser is back there. He does second camera and he does like these little vignettes. You might nice. Have seen them. Yeah, I did. I watched them online. Okay, cool. So that'll be done today. Um, next week is Bob Mool from Artisan Mobile. <laughs> Pretty awesome to have him come out. Um, after that, Bob Savino, who's the CTO of Movin, which is a new startup in the Philly area. Um, good. And one more Bob. And one more Bob after um, that. Robert J. Moore from RJ Metrics. Oh, yeah, RJ Metrics. So these are all kind of like later, those guys are later stage. How long has Insta Moore been rocking? Uh, about a year and a half. So that's cool. Other, slightly other end of the spectrum. Although Movin's pretty, pretty young, too. Um, we also do Night Owls on Wednesday nights, which is involved beer and progressive a goal or focus at all. Just kind of hanging out. Sounds out fun. Fun. And we've had demo night um, there too for apps. And so if you are ever interested in getting like real sure. concentrated feedback, you can talk to Ben and come out to do that. Um, we've pitched various times, various locations. Cool. So that's cool. Uh, what else? Uh, we have an incubator here uh, with two startups in it. And what else? Where we just finished some videos for the CCDC, which is the sponsor of, of the lab. We've got a new sticker under here, you can't see it. We're outside. It says power, uh, Innovation Powered by Fox Rothschild and CCDC, and we should really put Igniter TV up there. Ben. Yeah, you're right. And um, <coughs> they're laying out their 10-year economic growth plan for Chester County. Of course. So our mission here is to kind of raise awareness of, of innovation in the region. Of course. Facility. We're close enough. Yeah. And you guys include us. Sometimes. It's so funny. Most of us are actually in the area. She's in Valley Forge. Um, uh, ben, where are you at, Ben? Honey Brook. Jones in Jersey. I'm in Philly, but I went to college at Delaware Valley College in Doylestown. So. Oh, okay. And I used to hang out at Westchester University oh, yeah. back in well in the 90s when my friends went to this college. So. It's possible. <laughs> uh, been, around, been around, been around. So what else uh, do I have to say? Is there anything else? Now? Um, maybe the live tweet shout out just that we're. Oh yeah, I'm gonna at, be retweeting. Yeah, at, at Sherman Biz. Yeah. At yeah, just some more. Yeah. Yep, there's two of them. Or while she has anybody have a question, <laughs> yeah. Ben will curate yeah, them. Just tag us and we'll just shoot it out to the masses. So we'll do like 20, 30 minutes of content and then Q&A? Yeah, and, and if they want to ask questions during, that's even better. Yeah. I, I always prefer that because okay. I, I'm doing a non-traditional thing here. I'm not really going to talk about Instamore so, as so much as what got me to that point. Sure. Yeah. Things, things I learned along the way. That's great. And um, a little bit about Instamore. But it's mostly, to me, it's more about like what how I've gotten to this point. Yeah, this is great. Yep. All right, let me get out of the way. Sure. So as you already know, I'm Jason Sherman, CEO and co-founder of Instamore. Um, so like I said, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit non-traditional here. I, I've been an entrepreneur for over 10 years full time, uh, but I've also been an entrepreneur for almost 20 years because it led me to the point where I could do it full time. There's a lot of things I learned along the way. And the first being that there is no easy path. People always think that being an entrepreneur is the easiest thing in the world because I can do whatever I want, per se. But it also means that I don't get a paycheck and I don't have, you know, I have to pay for my own health insurance and uh, I have to work seven days a week, 24 hours a day, pretty much. And this is the number one thing I learned is there is no easy path. Uh, you know, it's the most challenging, difficult thing you'll ever do in your life. If you want something easy, get a job. That's what I tell people. Um, and the, the, the first thing you have to do in order to be an entrepreneur is take risks. And hopefully this will work for me today. There we go. Is take risks. Um, because if you don't do something that's really difficult, it's not valuable. Um, if it was easy, then any, everybody would be doing it and uh, everybody would be an entrepreneur. But the truth of the matter is most people that either I know or I meet, they have a job. They work at a law firm. They work in finances. They work in you know, IT. They work as a, you know, marketing or a nurse or a doctor. Um, those are all just you know, one-track jobs that you don't take much of a risk because you're always going to be uh, employed. So one of the first times I took a risk was when I was an IT 
a network administrator. I did have a job in IT corporate um, without getting into a huge backstory. Um, my degree is in computer information systems management for, uh, for computers. And I quickly got a job at IBM in 1998. Um, after a year, I quit because my music entertainment business was taking off and making me more money than my IT job was. So I took the entertainment business to the next level and made a, made a, a really decent a career in that. But that's not where I took my first risk, because that was not really a risk. I was already making a lot of money. My first risk was when I got tired of the IT world in 2004. <clears throat> and I realized I was making a company so much money from the work I was doing, but I was just getting a paycheck. Um, I mean, I was literally making this company about a million dollars a month from what I was doing. And it was you know, converting their technology from a static to internet-based uh, technologies. Um, and the owner wasn't giving me a bonus. He wasn't giving me an a equity share. It was just a paycheck. So um, they actually laid me off because they didn't need me anymore. And that day I realized I'm never going to go do that again. Next time I make a million bucks is for myself. So the, the risk I took was opening a consulting business, which I was already running um, for a few years then, but out of an office and a store. So I bought a, a property that had like a place just like this, and um, I did multifaceted businesses there. So I ran my consulting business. I did um, web design, graphic design, book publishing, um, electronic sales. I started getting employees to work for me and run, th run the front end for me. I did that for, for, for a whole bunch of years. And I started to kind of get, I felt like it was a job. I felt like, OK, I'm at this location every day. It's starting to feel like a job. Um, but I did become an expert at what I did. And, and that's the number one thing you have to do in order to be successful as an entrepreneur. You have to be an expert at what you're, what you're doing. So whether you want to be a cook or a chef or you want to be a dog walker or whatever it is, you have to know the ins and outs of your market. So that means research your competition if you have any. Um, if you don't, that's even better. Um, you know, you want to know how to do well, how to, how to fail also. Like what are the mistakes that other people have made? So find out what those are so you can avoid them. I've, I've actually done a lot of different things at that location when I was at the store or the office. I became an expert at other things as well because, again, I got kind of bored of doing it. So I wanted to kind of delve into other things. Now, I had written a book and published it. I had done the music career. But the last thing I hadn't done was become a filmmaker. I really enjoy film. I'm usually the one that films events like these. Um, so <clears throat> I, I learned how to become a filmmaker by getting the equivalent of a master's degree in film arts and media by teaching myself the history of film, teaching myself techniques, purchasing expensive equipment and learning how to use it, um, surrounding myself with other filmmakers and uh, working on their sets. And then when I realized I didn't like the way they were doing things and things weren't working out the way I wanted them to, I started doing it myself and, and it turned out to be a really cool experience. Um, one of the things that I just mentioned about having people around me is mentors. I mean, it's really important. So. One of the first times I'll never forget that uh, a mentor really affected my life was at that office that I had the store. And he would come in and just shoot the shit with me. He'd bring me coffee. And he was really old, you know, an, an older gentleman who's been there and done that. And he would also always say, hey, Jason, so how, how are things going? He would just sit down. And I'd look stressed out because I'm always at this slash office store and, you know, long hours. I can't take a break because I have to run it. And, uh, and he'd say, you really need to hire people to, to delegate to. And I'm a, I was a control freak. I was like, no, I, I know that I can get this stuff done. When I'd try to show someone how to do something, they would do it, but they wouldn't do it right. They'd fail, and then I'd have to spend time teaching them how to do it again. And then I end up doing the work myself. So that was a, a long period of me trying to train people. Eventually, I did find people who were capable of doing the things that I was good at. Maybe not as good, but good enough. So I really listened to that mentor who, and, and that, what, what that allowed me to do is it freed me up from being attached to the, to the office so much. And I was able to get out more and, and make a feature length film, um, which is what I did while I had that office in store. I, I was able to um, write a screenplay, produce and direct a film with a cast and crew of about 50 people. So it was a real movie. And it's, uh, it's being distributed now. We won uh, film festival awards and, uh, we got picked up by an agent and a distributor. It was on Netflix and Redbox and Amazon and Blockbuster and everything. So that was a, the Bucks County Massacre. Um, it was a, a found footage, like um, Blair Witch meets Paranormal Activity meets Cloverfield. That's what people call it. 
so that was kind of one of my big achievements. And <clears throat> that was really cool at delegating. Um, but again, to do a movie, you have to never stop learning. I had to keep teaching myself. I've watched probably the most movies I, I know of anybody. And that's the best way to learn something is to watch others do it. I've seen literally thousands and thousands and thousands of movies. I've read hundreds of screenplays. So I taught myself how to write a screenplay. Um, you know, being a filmmaker has helped me help the community because uh, as you've probably seen from my website, if you haven't, I film all the tech events, um, I photograph them, and then I write articles for the Philly or the Examiner. So be, learning these things along the way has helped me help others and not just help myself. That's kind of the whole point of being an entrepreneur is giving back to people around you. Um, so besides that whole story, and I can get more in depth with that, uh, is the Lee methodology. That's where tech startups come in. I'm sure you guys have heard Eric Ries and his book, um, The Lean Startup. So <coughs> this is the most important part of being a tech startup, is knowing that you don't want to, I guess, put a big circus out there. You want to just make a tent and then make sure everything in that tent's working well and then expand, you know, get everything going. Um, but a lot of people don't do this. And what I find is, especially college students, they come up to me all the time um, I sit on the board of a couple of startups now, and they bring an idea to me, and they say, here's my idea, what do you think? And I say, it looks great. You should build just this one piece of it first. Come back to me in a month or two and let me test it. Well, they come back to me with like 40 things built, and, and it's you know the entire social network that does everything. And I'm like, well, it's confusing. I don't know what it's doing, and what's your value proposition? Like, What's your main core functionality? And a lot of people don't really know how to get that through their heads, that you have to just build one piece of core functionality that is a no-brainer to somebody. Like, the, like your website, it just tells me what the weather is in my car, okay, if my car doesn't have it. So that's what it does. Well, no, maybe yours wants to also tell me where the coffee is in the next uh, block. And Well, no, so I tell a lot of people lean methodology is the way to go. And it's helped a lot of people instead of spending two years building something, maybe just three to six months. So that's really important. And networking is king, if my clicker likes to, there we go. Um, I originally, when I started going to networking events, I originally didn't understand the value of them. They were really repetitive. So I'd go to like a networking event, hey, how's it going? Nice to see you again, nice to see you again. Give out business cards, I'd never hear from anybody. Um, I'd get a lot of LinkedIn connections, but none of it would ever turn into a, hey, let's meet up for coffee sometime. It would never happen. I'd get a lot of email blasts of read my blog and read my podcast and whatever, whatever. And <clears throat> I almost started to not want to go to networking events anymore. Um, of course, I was covering them as, as a videographer, photographer, and journalist, so I kind of got forced to go to them. Um, <clears throat> it, it took years for me to finally realize that networking events are not about networking. They're about building relationships with people over time. And then at one point in time, it, there's gonna be a moment where you see, man, that guy is really good at this, and now I need him. So now I, could, now I have, like for example, um, a couple of people I've met over the years have become my board of directors, advisors for my companies, my programmers, marketing, you know, data metrics, uh, graphic design. So networking isn't really, to me at least, not about the networking. It's more about what happens over time from, me from meeting those people and seeing those people. Um, something I tell people all the time, I find this is a huge mistake, is, is people like to build a company. And I'll give you a great example. Instamore is actually my, my third tech startup, um, fourth if you count the second that I pivoted and changed to another company. Um, my co-founders from my original companies always wanted to, first and foremost, go to a lawyer, okay? They always said, I, I saw the social network movie, let's go to the lawyer first. So $10,000 later, <clears throat> we had a big pile of documents, you know, uh, agreements and all sorts of NDAs and, 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 you know, worthless pieces of paper because we didn't have a website. Uh, we just had all these documents. And they wanted to spend six months building a business plan and financial projections and a PowerPoint and an executive summary and an operational plan. And I can go on and on and on and on. And while those things are important, they are meaningless without a product. So that was the biggest problem I had with the first company was 
we spent all this time doing all that, and then we didn't even have a website. When we finally tried to build it with the team, it just didn't work. We tried, it was too big, too much, and we didn't understand the lean methodology at that point. Second company, um, it was 50-50. I, I, I refused to let these guys push me into doing that again, so I said, well, we can do that, but we have to build at the same time. And again, that didn't really work out so well, obviously, because we pivot, pivoted a second time, and, and it's just butting heads with people. So with Instamore, I finally decided this is the time that I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. And I actually built it by myself. I didn't have a co-founder. I avoided all the legal stuff. I avoided all the documentation. And I worked on a prototype. And that prototype, MVP, Minimum Viable Product, was enough to get the interest of a Kristen and a programmer and people. I, I built the first prototype myself, but I needed help. So I was able to get to a certain point where we had 10,000 users on our beta. OK, well, it worked. So now I can start working on some projections and a business plan and a PowerPoint and to pitch to investors. Um, and I kept building a team based on this product. But a lot of people do it the other way around. And, and it's, just, it's just wrong. I, I'll, I'll tell people over and over again, show me your MVP, then show me your business plan, which takes me to the next point, which is iterate, iterate test, and repeat. So as you guys all know, um, part of the lean methodology is to do this. So if you build an app that you know, takes pictures and posts them to your feed automatically without pushing any buttons, it's like a new thing maybe, well, do people really like that? So you hand it off to 100 people at a college maybe and say, what do you think of this app? And they're going to give you feedback. You take that feedback, you're going to change your app according to what they told you because they are the consumers. Um, small tweaks, small optimizations. Send it back to them, see what they say. Keep doing that over and over again until you find your sweet spot. People don't usually do that. What they do instead is they build this grandiose thing, whatever it is, whether it's a product or a widget or an app, and they expect people to just start using it. And then you have to educate them and teach them how to use it. Whereas if you start showing people early on, even when it's not ready yet, it could be a rinky-dink prototype that barely does anything, just get your initial feedback from them. And then from there, you'll be able to base your decisions on what you think actually should be built. So that's really important. And once you're ready to raise money, it really sucks because it's very time consuming. Um, you know, I've, we're right in the middle of raising our seed round now. And I just wrote an article last night. I don't know if anybody read it, but I just wrote it last night. It got some hits on Twitter and, uh, and LinkedIn. And basically, I wrote that I'm in seed round limbo because what I've been told more often than not by investors, is, oh, the hardest part of raising money is getting a signed term sheet and lead investors. And I have to say, that is the farthest from the truth. That was the easy part, was to get that signed term sheet and lead investors. The hard part is getting the second half of the money, believe it or not. So usually people say, oh, once you have a term sheet and you have half the money, the other half people just follow on board. It's not true, at least not for me. I, I've been pitching hundreds of investors, and they all say, <clears throat> How interested, how interested they are. But everything means no. So what that means for me is, I'm so interested in your idea. Instamore looks awesome. You have great, awesome growth. Send me your pitch deck. That's a no, right? Um, hey, we should meet for coffee sometime and discuss the, the logistics of your platform. That's a no. Hey, I, I love your idea, and I'd love to see your deck. We should talk again next week and discuss your round and how much you're raising. That's a no. Everything's a no, because all the times I've heard that from investors, I've never gotten a check from them, and I've never heard from them again. And it's almost pulling teeth to get them to reply to my emails. So all, anything I've ever heard from any investors is a no. There's a maybe, which is due diligence. So OK, Jason, I'm interested. Let's start due diligence. And for anyone who doesn't know what due diligence means, it's when investors want to start investigating your company, learning every single detail, every single number, metrics, analytics, growth, traction, projections, everything. That's due diligence. And once they feel comfortable with that, including your team members and having uh, meetings with them, that's when they're ready to write a check. So if I can get this thing to work. Usually what they want to know is traction, scale, and revenue. Those are the things that investors have been prodding me for. Um, we went from 10,000 users to 110,000 in three months. That's traction. That shows that we're really growing fast. Um, are we scalable? Yes. We're on Amazon servers. We're on iPhone, Android, and the web. We built all three platforms natively. Um, all of them can scale to 10 million users overnight. It's all built properly. They want to know, is that the way it's built? 
some people say, oh yeah, I have a website and I have uh, 10,000 users, and the, and the investor says, well, what happens if you get a million tomorrow? It'll probably crash if it's not built properly. Revenue, they always been, you know, they always bug you. Will you make money? Will you make us money? Well, yeah, we, we have revenue and it shows that we can earn a lot of it. Um, but it takes money to make money, which is why we're raising money. If you don't have these things, investors are gonna usually walk the other way. Even if you have these things, investors will walk the other way because they get pitched a thousand times a day. They hear every idea. Every idea is the next best thing. Every idea is the next Facebook. They don't really care. So that's why I think I wrote here, um, maybe in the next one, they want to care about your vision more. If you find an investor who cares about your vision and believes in you and what you're doing, that's how you're going to get a check written. Because traction, scale, and revenue, everybody has that, right? Everybody has some sort of like metric that says we're the best. But until you find someone who truly believes in what you're doing, which is what we did. We found investors who not only believe in what we do, but they see where it could go. And they are the ones that are pushing the investors for us instead of us having to do it. Because they, they see that this is the next thing, the next evolution in video messaging, video dating, whatever you want to call it. Um, so you have to know, do other people see what you're doing? Is this, is this a real problem? I mean, I have people who pitch ideas to me all the time and they say, um, here's my idea. It, does, um, it, it shows you your interests around you. Okay, well, is that a problem that someone's solving or is that just a cool app? And that's a big thing I noticed. A lot of people make platforms that don't solve a problem. They just do something that is useful. But I don't believe that that's the way it should be. I believe it should really, like when I built Instamore, it was really solving something painful to me. I had gone on thousands of bad dates, literally thousands. And the process of going on a bad date is pretty bad. You spend time filling out a profile and questionnaires. You then have to go meet somebody, which is gas, parking, parking tickets, food, drinks, time. And then you find out you don't even like the person. Do that a couple thousand times, no exaggeration, and you will build Instamore. Okay, because we, what we do is we take, that, we take that whole process out and we say, we'll give you that last minute, five minute face-to-face -face through the app. That's what we do. So that's really important. And obviously, if you find people who follow your vision, you'll find the right team. Um, everyone on our team is equity-based, so that's important. If you find people who immediately say, how much am I getting paid? Just walk the other way, because that's, they're looking for a job. And again, if you go back to my, one of my first slides, being an entrepreneur is not a job. It's a lifestyle. It's something that you have to learn how to do. It's, something, it's not that you wake up and you sit at a desk and you punch numbers all day. That's a job. So anyone who comes up to you and says, I'm a programmer and I can help you build this thing better, but I need $50,000 up front, they can eat a dick, no offense. And, and, and the only reason I say that is because there's plenty of people out there that will believe your vision and they'll make your business 10 times better because they believe in it, as opposed to, well, I got my paycheck. Quick question for you, you say you can grow. How do you do that with young people? Which is, I mean, I know people that come by and say, that is really good, but I've only been out of school a couple of years, they don't have much money. How is that person supposed to live if they're taking equity from you and they're not getting a paycheck? That's a, that's a great question, and it's actually the other way around. The young people are the ones that are the easiest to get on board because they usually live with their families, they live with their parents. Um, they don't have any bills because they just got out of school. So yes, yeah, school loans, big whoop, right? That's about it. They don't have a house, they don't have a car, they don't have insurance, they don't have to pay for kids usually. They don't have to do all these things that people my age do have to do. You know, Kristen's a great example. She has an eight-year-old son. She has a mortgage, she has a kid, she's got a car, she's got all sorts of bills. That college kids don't have that. So for her to do it for equity was very difficult, and it still is, but she does it because she has the vision, she believes in the idea, she knows that it's gonna go somewhere. Whereas a college kid, you know, for him it's like, well, I'll get some experience, right? I'll be a part of a big company and learn something that I didn't learn in college, and there's a chance for me to make a lot of money young. Whereas for us to, to make a lot of money, we don't look at it that way anymore. We look at it as we're solving a problem, we're gonna do something really big here. If we make money, that's great, but that's not why we do it. We're doing it for the, the, the vision of what we think we can do out of this. The kids are looking more for you know, either a paycheck or whatnot. Which brings me to, the, to this point of loving what you do. 
Um, Confucius said, choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. And I can't tell you how true that is. I've been working, again, as an entrepreneur full time for 10 years and I wake up with a smile on my face every day. Sure, there's bad days, everyone has them. But the fact of the matter is I'm satisfied, I'm happy, and I don't feel like I work. You know, I'll be coding, I'm happy. Working on a design, I'm happy. Marketing, I'm happy. At an event, I'm happy. Anything I do, I'm happy. It's, it's, it's what an entrepreneur lifestyle is all about, is doing what you love and you know, not thinking so much of it as being work, which is why I recommend people to be an entrepreneur if you can. Because you complete freedom. You can do whatever you want, whenever you want, as long as you get your job done. I can work from my iPhone, my laptop. I can travel, I can take vacations, I can spend time with my family, my friends, my dog. I can go to the gym at 10 o'clock in the morning instead of 5 p.m. when it's packed. You know, as long as I get my work done, that's all that really matters. Now, th that also means, this, this, the first part of loving what you do, that means that if I'm working at 11 o'clock at night, which I do often, or at 1 a.m., it's okay because, you know, that's what it is. You work when you want to. It's not like a set schedule. So these are the upsides to being an entrepreneur that I tell people. Obviously, there's always the downsides, but, you know, I try to keep it positive. And as you already know, Instamore is here to help people avoid bad dates forever. Um, that's that's our, our mantra. We feel as though it's definitely working. Like I said, we've scaled 11 times in the past three months, so it's pretty big. And, um, yeah, and, and, and I have... I have other things I could tell you guys about my past businesses if you'd like to hear about it, um, but I'm open to other questions. I'm Kyle Hudson, Launch Labs. Um, how do you value your first product when you have it? Like when, when you, you, know, you create something that no one's really made before, how do you know how much it's worth when the investors are coming? To you? Yeah, valuation, that's a good question because that's something that comes up all the time, actually. Um, valuation's a tough one because it's not something that you can just set you usually need a valuation company to do it for you. But there's industry averages, okay? So you can look at your, your competitors, if you have any, and what are, what are they valued at when they got their funding, right? Or what are they valued at when they got acquired? How many users did they have? What's the, the math there, right? So WhatsApp got purchased for $19 billion, 450 million users. So their users are worth, you know, whatever that math comes out to. It's like 20 something a piece. Um, for us, the valuation was attuned to our team, our technology that was built, how many users we had, how much funding we raised from friends and family, um, and what the valuation was then. Uh, we, we went to the Start Fast Venture Accelerator this summer, so we got accepted out of uh, 1,000 companies, um, 15 got chosen to pitch, and then six got chosen to be at the accelerator. We were one of six. So when we got money from the accelerator, there was a valuation set on the contract. So that's right there. We had an uh, evaluation for there. So there's different ways of getting valuations. Right now, we're valued at um, our current round. We're valued at 2.8 million, um, which sounds like a lot, but it's not. It's actually very, you know, very low uh, because, you know, there's companies out there that are getting that in funding. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, valuation. It's it's a, it's a combination of things. It's um, industry averages and and um, you know what you have built. Because that counts. Like, I mean, we have iPhone, Android, and a website built. Well, how much would it cost you to do that, and how long would it take? Well, that's worth money, right? And then our 110,000 users times the industry average, what are they worth? Our team, we're all full-time. We're worth money. We, we could earn. I mean, I could be earning $100,000 a year as a developer right now, but I choose not to. So I'm worth something, you know? Um, house rules, intro yourself before speaking. I just want to add one thing on there that even if you uh, don't know how to do valuation, come up with a, a way of getting to that number that you can yeah. defend, because it's better to be wrong, and, but have thought through met methodically, uh, than to just feel like you're throwing up a number and saying, because yep. my gut tells me. So you, so. Sh you should have that nailed. You should have you know, a document that even outlines it for you. Projections help too. You know. You spoke about that relationship between entrepreneurship and problem solving. Yes. And philosophical question. Uh, what do you remain curious about and how do you see the world? You see what the person has a really interest. What do I remain curious about? Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess I can, I can get into my background a little more. Um, I grew up in a musical family. <laughs> Uh, my, my parents, um, my mother's from Spain and my father's from Philadelphia. He's a music, he was a music teacher 
and my mother was a fourth grade teacher, so they're both teachers. So I traveled a lot around the world. Um, so I loved travel and learning languages. I speak three, and I play multiple instru instruments. So I've always loved music and classical especially. So that's one of the interests that really encompassed a lot of my life. Um, and then writing, I've written books, screenplays, articles, and then film. I've made movies and, and other things like that. So I've kind of tapped into the whole entertainment atmosphere. Technology is my thing. That's my skill. So I've already done a ton of technology things. I've also had the, the, you know, the, 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 the privilege of running a, a space. So I had a, an office, too. So I've done that whole thing. So I'm trying to get to the point of where what's left, right? So... Um, from, from there, I've, I've volunteered my time for lots of different things, whether it's homeless and, and pets and, and, and things like that. Um, and I've also uh, been able to, to learn a lot about um, things that, that, I, that I don't know a lot about. And that's kind of where I'm at now. I'm trying to figure out what's next. And um, I guess space exploration, who knows? I mean, <laughs> um, I, I'd really, really, the truth is what I'd really like to do is, is one day be able to help out entrepreneurs. Um, a lot more than I have been. Um, right now, it's more skill-based, and I'd like to help them out financially one day. Um, by, you know, I have so many people pitch to me on a regular basis who just need 25 grand to 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 just make it happen, and and they can't find that 25 grand in Philadelphia. It's almost impossible. I'd like to be that 25 grand um, to people. So maybe that's kind of the thing: is helping more Philadelphia people have their ideas spread faster. And that's Lynn. Um, and I don't know if you know anything about the incubator here, but we're targeting that area pre, we call it pre-early stage. Because we know that compared to three years ago, what you can do in a weekend with a decent middle-of-the-road skill set is amazing. Mm -hmm. Like with the API economy, you can solve yep. complex problems by putting off-the-shelf stuff together. And so that, that 25,000 can do a lot. So that's our entire focus is that area. That's awesome. Nobody does it. Nobody right? does it. Even the people who call themselves seed, seed stage, they'll say, well, do you have $50,000 a month in revenue? Well, if I did, I'm, I wouldn't be wouldn't here. Wouldn't be here right, right? now. <laughs> I, I know. Oh, yeah. It's a sure bet. Um, so that's, that's what we're facing right now. It's a great point is... is we go to seed stage, early stage investors who say they invest up to $150,000 and we go to them with everything is right on point and they still don't put in. And we already have half the money raised. It's, it's, it's mind boggling. It really is mind boggling is how, how can we have every duck in a row and you know they're not pulling the trigger. So that's why I'd like to help out at some point. Hey, how are you? My Good. name's Dan Lawson, a local aspiring entrepreneur. Cool. Um, Good for you, man. No, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, very inspiring uh, presentation this morning. Uh, you mentioned starting a few other companies previous yep. at Instamore. I'd love to know more about kind of your uh, practices uh, through kind of the idea extraction, you know, learning where the, you know, your, your passions come from. And then you know, how do you validate those ideas um, you know, with a, a population? And then if you could, uh, just in regards to kind of the whole MVP, uh, how do you keep you know, your potential customers engaged through that process? You know, after they may, you, know, you give them round one, they hate it. Like, how do you get them to look round two? Right. Yeah, we'll have to go in a step. What was, so can you go through the first? Sorry, yeah. Just like, where do your ideas come from? You know? So the like, first question was, OK, so ideas, I can't even tell you. My brain is crazy. <laughs> Um, I've been known to be extremely creative my whole life, probably thanks to my parents and the school that I went to on, at an early age, uh, which was called the Institute for the Achievement of Human Potential. Um, it's a pretty awesome school. They teach you calculus, um, languages, music, computers, and they had astronauts show up, and I was a kid. So like, I must have learned a ton there. It really helped. Um, from there, I was always inventing things. Um, I invented a board game when I was like five years old. I wrote a children's book when I was, I believe, six. Um, I've invented food products. I've invented uh, actual physical electronics. Um, I, I've, I've loved to find something that's not there and make it happen. If I don't like something or if I have a problem with something, I want to fix it. And um, part of the presentation was become an expert, never stop learning. You know, you have to really dive. So here's a great example. So um, I didn't know how to write a screenplay. That's hard, 
believe it or not. You think a screenplay is easy to write, try to write one. Mm -hmm. um, a book, sure, you can write a book. I've written and published books before. That's a little easier. You still have to learn how to do it. Now, there's no right or wrong to writing a book. That's a known fact. Just like there's no right or wrong to making a song or a movie. Anything goes. There's no right or wrong to you know, designing something because everything is okay. But there are rules and there's something called best practices and you know, so you have to really learn those. So my, my, my thing that, that I would suggest is anytime you want to do something, it doesn't matter what it is, anything you want to do, just try to really learn the, the basics first. Go on Wikipedia, do some research, buy a book at the library, go online, watch, you, watch tutorials. Really understand the fundamentals of what it is you're doing before you actually start. Because then you'll know, oh, well, that's how you do this. Oh, well, that's what that was for, and that's what this is. So really learn first and ask other people. Right? Go to someone like me and say, hey, how do, how do you make a movie? Or how do you do this? Or how do you do that? Well, I can explain to you in like a day, you know, or an hour or whatever. Next part of the question? The, uh, just keeping, like, I mean, you know, validating the idea. You know, like, how do you, when you think of something, you know, what, what's your next step? You know, like, what, I mean, I understand, like, understanding the basics, but when you've got to speak to a potential market, yeah, so, how do you, like, how do you, so, so that goes to one of the points, too, is um, are you really solving a problem? So like, ask yourself, is this a problem or is this something useful? Useful things are Nest. I think I see one on the wall over there. An iPhone is something useful. Um, it doesn't really solve a problem, except if you think about it where, the, where if you're lost and you have the GPS or if you have to write an email immediately or if you have to take a picture of something. It's kind of solving a problem, but it's more useful, right? Um, what would be solving a problem is if I could somehow, you know, take a pill and a display shows up and everything's in front of me, right? And I take a pill and I don't have to work out anymore. I take a pill and I don't have to eat anymore. I could take a pill and I don't have to sleep anymore. That's a problem, right? Because sleeping, you're losing a third of your life. So if you can solve the problem of sleeping or aging or any of those things, now you're talking something worth, and that's validated automatically, right? Um, if you can't do those things, then you can build like an app or something, a very, very simple app. Show a group of people just like this room right here and just hear what they have to say. Take that and the, you're going to get, trust me, you're going to get the same feedback from all of them when it comes to a certain aspect. Like I'm, I'm, I'd like to give an example somehow. Let's say this wood right here and you'd like to show how different finishes would look on it or different paint colors. Well, I think there's an app that does that. Well, maybe someone will say, well, wouldn't it be great if you could have this show up on there too, on, on the app without actually having it on the wall to see how it looks? There's an app for that too. So that would have came from the users. And you'd say, oh, maybe I should put that in my app. You know. So that's kind of how it works. Now, don't always let them dictate you because it's your idea, right? But you definitely need that feedback and then you have to change it, bring it back to them, see what they say again. You won't lose people who, who believe in it. You won't, you, you, you won't lose them. You'll lose the ones that just don't care in, in general. You had a third part to your question. No, that's, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Jessica Pierce Hall, I'm sorry I came a little late from the Hi. labs. Um, if no one plugged it, please come to Indie Film Night on Thursday. Nice. It's be a great time at seven. Um, and, and we're having a special release, Boxcar Brewing Beer, Boxtoberfest, keg on this Wednesday, and it's happening on Thursday. So for no other reason, you have to be filming. Sorry, okay. Um, you talked about being a really, really creative person and having really a limitless well of ideas, which is funny because it's, um, it's like the same way that I am. But how, what do you, something that I find is helpful is actually I think boundaries are incredibly liberating to the creative process for me. And I know a lot of people are like, oh, give me unlimited boundaries, give me no boundaries, and that's more creative. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on what is the value, or is it a restriction to have sort of really tight boundaries put on creativity? I've lived an insane life when it comes to that. Um, I've done things that I never thought were possible, and which made me realize everything's possible. Um, I've only done things that are very challenging. So if something's not challenging, I haven't wanted to do it. And I, I mean, I, I, sometimes I can't believe it. People always come up to me and say, how the hell have you done the things you've done? And I sometimes don't even know the answer to that. I just do it, right? And that's the key is just getting things done, learning how to do them, becoming an expert at it, finding people around you that can help you do that, and just get it done. So I don't look at the boundaries of it. I, look at, I, I actually look at it the opposite. I look at it as there are no boundaries. It's, it's more about how far can I make this thing go? Can I make a movie and win awards? I have no idea, but I'm going to damn try. And I did, right? But it, it took a long time. It was hard to do, but it was so worth it. 
I didn't see the boundaries. I saw the, the I saw the the, 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 the the horizon. You know, if anything, and and if you look at the boundary as a horizon instead of a, a, instead of a wall, you'll keep going towards it and keep to- going towards it until there's so- a destination at some point. Um, which again, people always say, enjoy the journey, not the destination. That is key. You have to enjoy yourself every day and not worry about where you're getting to. I never worry about where I'm getting to. That's why I've been enjoying myself for so for so long. Uh, I've thought a lot about that boundary setting, and I, I think a lot back to school. Traditional school, schooling lays out the goals to achieve. And if you spend 15 years in that system, you kind of, you're delivered the the expectation, and then you meet it, and then you get the next one. I know that that's not, you know, pervasive or 100%, but you've been in a different educational environment, and What's your sense of, of whether that's a corrupting influence? I, 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 yeah, it's funny. I, um, I always tell people that are going to go to college, um, unfortunately, I tell them that they probably should think twice. Um, I have a college degree, and I don't, I don't use it, and I don't think I learned anything in college that, that I've learned in the real world, unfortunately. Public school before that, you know, what did I learn? You know, that Magellan did something around the world or, you know, Columbus. I could have read that online now. Um, I, just, I, just, I just think it's better to... I, I enjoy learning for myself. So if I don't know how to do something... Like, I taught myself how to code, right? I didn't learn that in college. I taught myself all the different kinds of languages that I was interested in learning. Um, and I learned how to graphic design myself, you know. No one taught me how to use Photoshop. Um, so... I think that you should learn to do things on your own. Why take a class in it when you can take your own class in it? You know, so. I've heard a lot about the STEM academies. How those, those someone told me that they're as an employer, they're finding STEM academy high school grads are more impressive than local college grads. Yeah. Because the problem, I, I, if I if I'm getting STEM right or wrong, let me know. But it's it's here's the problem. The, the teacher is a coach on the side. Yep. And so go at it in a multidisciplinary way. That's like the startup. Today. I agree. I agree with that. It's less regurgitation and more pragmatism, so people can go out and actively solve problems rather than, you know, I was taught this Which fact and allow me to share it with you. Yeah, I agree with that. The whole issue about process and problem solving. I mean, it seems like you have a wonderful innate sense about how to solve a problem. I think it's the issue. I think is not whether you look. I'm really the issue is how you learn. And I think that young people who are being given road information don't understand there are several ways to solve things. I'm sure in your, in your trajectory and path in life, I think that's one of the issues that you grapple with. And it gives you a bench of pleasure in terms of the boundary issue. You know, how to solve a problem means that there are a number of different solutions, right? And yeah, it's actually a, very, it's a, it's a large number of mistakes is what it is. Yeah. So, you know, as you know, Edison took 400 tries to make a light bulb, right? But he said that he... He held in his mind. Yeah. He, 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 he said he, he, said he uh, you know... Uh, yeah, he, he succeeded at 400 ways on how not to do it. So that's and, that's... and that's... I mean, I definitely, definitely see that. I have done things in my life where um, I was running a business and I might have lost, you know, $100,000 on a dime because I just made a horrible, horrible, horrible mistake. But, of course, I've never done that again. Um, and then I've made $100,000 uh, in an hour because I made a really smart move based on that last mistake. So, um, you know, you, you have to really just know um, the best ways to navigate those mistakes, learn from them. And, again, if you surround yourself with people smarter than yourself, you can avoid mistakes, too, because you might, you know, say, hey, you know, tell me how to do this thing that I'm about to do. And this, I've done it before. And don't do this, this, and this, and this. Okay, well, I'm going to avoid those things, you know. Um, you'd be surprised how, how that works when you when you surround yourself with people. Uh, David Chopko, um, I work for a small investment banking firm, also teaching universities. I'm not sure I'm 100% agreement you're about not going to college. But <laughs> no, I, mean, I have a degree. I mean, I, I, de- definitely go to college, but definitely yeah, learn yeah. on your own too. Uh, two questions. They're not actually connected. <laughs> Oh. And two, um, I'm very interested in how you determine what the price you charge for your program. I mean, I'm doing an awful lot with pricing, so I'm just curious. How charge you for my program? Or, well, someone, someone oh, how we earn revenue? Yes. 
Okay, so I'll, I'll address that first. Um, okay. So revenue, there's, there's a couple ways. Um, the first way is on our actual website. We have Google AdSense. So we get a um, dollar for every 300 CPMs, okay. um, and we have like a million. So that's one way, and that's scalable. The second way is implemented on our Android app right now, not iPhone, just Android, as we're testing it. It's um, in-app purchases, so you unlock a cool feature for a dollar, um, you get a feature unlocked, and we have like five or six features we can add on to that. We just have one right now. 7% um, of our users are buying it, so that's a cool number. Um, once we unlock that on iPhone, we can double it, and then we can add more features and triple, quadruple. So we're still in the beginning stages, but we've proven that people will purchase it, and we have proven that the Google AdSense works. The third and final way that we are currently working on while we're in bootstrap mode is video ads. Now, it's not the typical video ad. It's our, our platform is video profiles. So you get to see someone's uh, personality through a video. Well, before you do that, you're going to see a six-second ad from any one of a million advertisers, and we would earn a uh, revenue from that. But we're going to give it back to the person that owns the video. So as an example, if he has a video on Instamore and a girl's going to watch it, she's going to see a, a six-second ad first, and he's going to earn 10% of the revenue we make from that ad so that he's incentivized to share his profile with people to watch it. That's how we're going to get people hooked. Second, secondly, through video calling, instant chat and phone calling, which is part of our platform, he's also going to get money from all the ads that show up on there. So he's going to want to make conversations with lots and lots and lots of girls, or girls are going to have lots of conversations with guys. And girls are really good at getting guys reeled in. So it's, it's a way to make money for these people now instead of just us making money. We want to give back to them and say, hey, we care about you. We want you to make money. It's a supplemental income. If you do really well, we'll up the percentage. So it's really interesting. A lot of investors like it. They're not writing checks, but they love how interesting it is. <laughs> so I love hearing it's so awesome. It sounds great. Well, can I get a check, please? So we're we're um, we're raising uh, a, our term sheet that we signed is uh, three hundred thousand um, dollars as a minimum, and we have half of that filled from our lead investors. So we need the other. Looking for one hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, it's not even a lot of money. But believe it or not, these 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 investors out there, they can't even. I mean, I even ask them for fifty thousand sometimes. Out there is where we're um, all, all over Philadelphia is where we try to get the money. Where we've got, our lead investors are from New York. That's obvious. They're from New York. Everyone in New York will give you money. So, <laughs> so we're still looking in New York now. I think go back to New York. That's what we're doing now because, and it's a shame because I've been really trying to give these these, and everyone in Philly knows me. I've been trying to give them a chance to be a part of this because I support the tech community in Philadelphia, and I was hoping they'd support me back. You know, but they don't, and it's unfortunate because I've been supporting them for years now without asking for anything in return. The round, the round can go to six hundred thousand to a million, though. That's what the term sheet says. What do you think? Um, you said it's Philly a little bit easier in New York because the volume of money. A, a lot places. easier in New York. So, what do you think it is that the Philly investors or say East Coast investors are looking? For? Like so we know West Coast are throwing money around. It's really easy. We went to San Francisco, Las Vegas, um, and New York. Those are the three places we've hit up. They are all about the California slash New York model. That's, that's it. They don't care how much money you're making. They care how many users you have and how big the idea is. Philly investors care about how much money you're making, and they don't care how many users you have because they're more of a traditional investor looking for like a widget manufacturer. Like how many smartwatches did you make? How much are you charging for them? How much can I make on them? You sold a thousand already, and you're selling a thousand a month. Here's the money you need to scale. They're more of a bank. Okay. Inve Philly investors are banks. They're not investors. I've pitched in front of all of them, and they all say the same thing: awesome idea, great traction, awesome growth. We love what you're doing. You're amazing, but you're, you're just too early for us. And I'm like, I thought you were an early stage, and isn't that what the definition of an early stage investor is? Or am I confused? So. Uh I had, we had Rick Nucci here uh, yeah, he's three awesome. months ago, and I work he, with him a lot. That's cool. He, he, he had a good bit of advice, and he said, don't look for investors by, and, and ask them for money, because it makes the situation awkward. Yeah, hey, you ask like, for advice. Every time you're meeting, it's like the same question. Look at them as help, and find out the, the way that they're comfortable helping you. And that really made me, that really shook my brain. It's like... Money is not the only form of help. Yep. So it, you can sometimes find people that will give you their time, maybe their money, but it's a process that you really can't control. Uh, and that seemed to be a more intuitive, natural way. 
because it is frustrating. And I almost think, in retrospect, it's important to document how much time you're spending trying to raise money because it'll blow your mind. Oh, I already right? know. And then you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> it's ridiculous. The return on investment here is like, phew. Yeah, it's hard. So maybe if you spent all that time building product, you know, you, you wouldn't need it. And in some ways, the beginning of your conversation made me think, are we getting to the a point in time where maybe capital isn't as required or the, the idea of venture capital is only for maybe super late stage because you can do so much and yeah, I don't know. There's some there's no, something it's, you know, it, no, it's great it, it's great points and um, going off of that um, one of the things I, I've told people a million times on that is don't ask an investor for money, ask them for advice because that's what I've done for years. I've been asking for advice and just building relationships and that's how I've gotten to the point where I'm now pitching them, right? So I've already built the relationships over years. Um, I've already hung out with them just as an entrepreneur and an investor. I've already done volunteer work for them more than once. So they know who I am and now it's like, okay, hey, do you mind if I show you what I have? Okay, yeah, let's set up a meeting. Done the pitches, right? So I've gotten all past the relationships and the advice and all that stuff. Um, but the capital part, see, I, I do believe that bootstrapping is the way to go because that's what I've done on all my companies. Some of my businesses I've sold and I've, I've made enough where I can, you know, do what I want, right? But not everybody can do that. And not only that, but with Instamore right now, we're at the point where we really do need a cash infusion. We can keep going at the pace that we're going. Sure, we can keep building and building, and, and, but it's going to be very slow, right? They won't be fast. We need more developers. We need more marketing help. You know, we need help. We can't do it ourselves. Um, we're just a team of three or four, and it's just not enough. We need six, seven, eight, you know? And money is how you can get some really talented people to help you grow fast. Craig Fox, entrepreneur wannabe. Cool. Um, hey, it's better than not wannabe. <laughs> <laughs> um, when, uh, can you speak to intellectual property? And, sure. And when you, uh, Patent your idea, maybe it's not patented. Provisional patent in, in progress. Yeah, um, yeah and, I mean. And how are you uh, talking, you know, when you're developing your idea, you need feedback. Yeah. And uh, you don't deal with it. It's got to go with it. Um, you know, investors don't sign NDAs, so you got to get past the fact that investors are going to hear your idea, but they hear a thousand a day, so. Um, you definitely want to have potential team members sign NDAs, um, non disclosure agreement. Um, also, independent contractor confidentiality agreements. So if you have someone like a programmer joins your team, you want to have it say that everything he or she builds for you is the company's, not his or hers. So you own everything. Because if not, they can say, well, I own this code and I can make my own now. Non-competes as well. Um, so just got to be careful. That's when the, the legal stuff comes into play. Um, and luckily, all the damn companies I had paid all the money for legal forms, I had them already. So I just kind of changed the names on all of them. Um, and I ended up getting a pro bono uh, legal assistance in Philly for my volunteer work. So uh, volunteer work's a big thing. If you do volunteer work, you get everything for free. So um, free legal, um, free accounting, uh, free you know p press, uh, free everything. I haven't paid for. That's how we've been able to succeed because I haven't paid for much. We do all the work ourselves in house or um, the volunteer companies. So, but IP, yeah, you definitely you definitely want to protect your idea with patents or. Trademarks. Well, well how, how do you, um, you know, as you're kind of putting your product out for your initial group of users and getting back? Well, you just have them sign NDAs. If they, you know, copy you, just sue the hell out of them. Or, tr uh, or try to. One thing I learned uh, yesterday about um, intellectual property for, for products that you could download and use and test, that the convention is that you can just do what's called a quick wrap click through agreement where you put all the terms in there and just by clicking and downloading that thing you are down by that contract. That's cool. It's kind of maybe a commonplace, but I didn't think that that's the way most of the world works. So you can distribute technology that way broadly, quickly, and, and that's the convention. Because we have a product and we've been really concerned about encrypting it and obfuscation and then somebody just said step back you know the world works this way not that way because someone will get into it if they yeah. want to just and so you have to just pray and hope people aren't assholes you know <laughs> I mean that's really what it comes down to <laughs> uh, maybe one more qu quick question and then we can hang out and out of time coffee and yeah. Ben um, so 
you know, one of the things that res it all resonated with me because it's all inherently pretty um, obvious. These things are, are things that I feel like if you if you think hard enough about it, um, these are good choices to make as an entrepreneur. Um, one of them that I think is maybe the best one is um, when you're looking for people to invest in you, they, that they share that vision um, with you. And if if maybe the investors um, in this area, maybe even in the Northeast um, lack that vision. Have you considered, or have you gone elsewhere? And perhaps, and more stereotypically, have you gone to to, to the West Coast, where um, people are kind of willing to yeah. take a chance? Um, yeah, we tried San Francisco and Vegas. Um, we went to a bunch of conferences out there and pitched a million investors. Again, everything means no, right? right. So right. unfortunately, even though they were all slobbering and drooling and excited, but no one wrote a check. So even with following up and following up and following up, even with the signed term sheet. So unless you're actually living out there, I think, I think you need to do the same thing I did here for the past four years, which is really ingrain myself into the tech community and volunteer even, you know. Right. Since I haven't done that out there, they don't know me, you know, between a stick and a wall. So um, I think that's the problem, really. Um, but that being said, New York is, to me at least, just as good. And that's where we got our investors. Cool. That's, that's, that's where we got our, our vision believed in, and that's where we got our, our first half of the round. Getting that second half is, again, it's, be, it's a challenge because um, we have to get more investors from New York, whereas someone from Philly could easily fill that. And, and it, you know, they spend that in AC on a weekend, you know? Um, right. and have I, you gone to Ben Franklin? Um, I have. I know Alan Krauss very well. They, they, um, they like our idea. They've been working with me for about a year um, in terms of, you know, progress and stuff like that because they're very progress oriented and they, they don't just jump in um, super early. They usually jump in when they feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. So I'm still waiting for that moment to happen. Um, but, you know, we talk all the time, Alan and I. And, um, you know, so he's a cool guy and he's really smart. He knows what he's, he knew, he knows what he's talking about. Um, so I feel like, you know, we'll get something out of Ben Franklin sometime either this year or next year maybe. Um, one more thing is just 1001, so stick with me for like one more or two more minutes. What did you learn from your accelerator program? I know I reached out to you to speak here when you were in New York. Yep. Um, just, I we were there, yeah. You, that was you? insane. Um, that's really the main thing I learned at the accelerator is micro experiments. Uh, we, st we still run them. Uh, micro experiments is, for example, running a Twitter ad to 25 to 34 year old women who have iPhones, who live in Georgia in an area that's full of single people and you know x x x x x x and you hit that demographic see what happens in a couple days and if it, and if your metrics show that you did really well keep doing it and make the budget higher um micro that cost? could be 50 bucks could be five could be 500 could be five thousand could be five million so um, <laughs> yeah, it's all you. You always set your budgets, and that's kind of what a micro experiment is. You say, "Well, I want to get 50 people that that are that are going to match this thing." That, that that's just one type of micro experiment. There's others. You can run a survey um, and ask, you know, a hundred people uh, five questions about your platform, which is uh, my original thing of getting feedback. And then 56% of the people might say, "I love this feature." Well, you know, to keep that. Well, maybe 10 say that they don't like that feature. Well, then maybe you don't want to use that feature anymore. It's a micro experiment, something small, and, and you don't want to spend a lot of time on it or a lot of money on it. But the data you get from it, you want to drive your decisions based on that and explode it and make it bigger. That's how we've gotten to, to 110,000 users in three months, by running these little experiments and putting more money down on red or putting more money down on number 22 and just making it work and, and, and you know, doubling down where it worked. And um, I, I think we've become experts at that. We, we can scale this thing. If we were to uh, raise our 300,000, we can scale to about a million users in about a year um, with a completely solidified infrastructure development wise and some pretty awesome organic growth along with that to the point where we could go viral right after that. We, we just, you just never know. Uh, have you gone directly to the CEOs of all the other similar companies, right? Like, just a couple. I'd like to avoid that right now only because they're, they're dead set on what they're doing and I've gotten some feedback and um, advice from some of them. Mm -hmm. But they're not really trying to help us out right now. You know, if anything, they want to maybe one day hopefully acquire us, you know? Yeah. Right, exactly. That's kind of the goal. All right, so let's uh, wrap up. Thank you cool. for coming. Thanks. Thanks. I'd love to put your uh, presentation on our blog.